that standpoint. Uh, this was a, a recent time magazine. This rock powered the world. And, and I think you'll see with the amount of gas that's here that it literally can. But everybody hears about this word, Marcellus Shale. Um, what a lot of people don't know is what actually is the Marcellus Shale and why is it called that? Well, it's a 400 million year old ocean. How many people knew that? I only learned a couple weeks ago, so don't feel bad. Um, it's a 400 million year old ocean. And like any ocean, you start on the shore and then it goes down and it goes down deeper and then it comes back up. It comes back up on the ground in Marcellus, New York. Uh, hence the name Marcellus. And it extends uh, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. 400 million years ago, in the bottom of that ocean, there was plants, there was algae, there were fish swimming around, and as the earth changed and compressed, that layer of aquatic life, of plant life, got trapped. And as it decomposed, it created methane. That's what we're tapping into. Why now? Why so important? Two types of um, new uh, ways to get at that from a technology standpoint. Hydraulic fracturing, uh, which we've all heard about. It's been going on for 60 years. But what hydraulic fracturing allows us to do is to be able to pull more of that gas out using something else called horizontal drilling. So instead of putting a whole bunch of holes in the ground, you're able to put one or two holes and capture a lot more gas. The other thing that makes this very important is our location, Pennsylvania and New York's location to the major markets. The east, the northeast, is the largest consumers of gas, specifically to heat their homes in the winter. Just like on a toll booth, every time you go through the toll booth, the state, the city, and the municipality charges a fee, your gas is the same thing. Right now, the majority of your gas comes from either Canada, Texas, Oklahoma, and it comes up pipelines. And every time it goes through another area, they tap on a fee. Now you'll be able to generate your own gas, thereby reducing all of those fees. And so you can see how that could lower the price. This shale gas phenomenon isn't just locally, it's globally. You can see where throughout the world there are shale gas plays that we know about. There are many more that we do not know about. In the United States, there is shale all throughout the continental United States. <coughs> and here in Pennsylvania, New York, West Virginia, parts of Maryland, Ohio, you can see the footprint of the Marcella Shale. We also have what's called the Utica Shale below that. The Utica Shale is a little more uh, rich in some liquid gases. We'll talk about that. But combined, they are potentially the second largest natural gas reserve in the world. And to give you an idea of that impact, there are four wells in Susquehanna County that produce more gas than 3,200 wells in West Virginia. That's four wells producing more gas than 3,200 wells. And each one of those wells can power 25,000 homes and businesses for the next 50 years. That's an amazing number. It's important to understand from an industry perspective how we operate. Basically, we categorize ourselves three ways. Upstream, midstream, and downstream. Pulling the gas up out of the ground, using pipelines to get it, and then selling it at market. Bringing it into your homes. There are two types of gas. There's dry gas, which is what we have here in the Northeast. There's also wet gas. All of them can be used to do everything from create plastics, to fuel your car, to heat your home. Out in the Pittsburgh area is a dry gas, wet gas line. And basically what that means is that here in the Northeast, with burning off just a little bit of water as that comes out of the ground, it goes right into the pipeline. There is no processes necessary. So it goes from the ground to the pipeline into your home. So then you can turn on your stove or turn on your furnace. Out in the Pittsburgh area is wet gas. And you need to refine it a little more. While this map is a little outdated, it gives you an idea of where the majority of drilling has been concentrated. And while the price of gas is low and more rigs have been taken down here in the northeast and going up in the southwest because of the price of gas, while the rig count is down by over 48 uh, wells at this time last year, the actual production numbers are up because the wells have been so plentiful with gas. I mentioned about this liquid gas. So when you take the liquid gas out, 74% of it's methane. But the other 25% has other liquids in it, the majority being ethane. And then from that, you also get propane, butane, and other gas chemicals. 
This is a picture of a fractionation plant, not to be confused with hydraulic fracture. What this allows you to do is when you take that wet gas, it allows you to separate out that methane and then the ethane pieces of that. Some folks may have heard about the potential of a cracker plant. Uh, Pennsylvania's been talking a lot about a cracker plant, potentially a $20 billion plant that is to be built hopefully in western Pennsylvania. What that cracker plant allows you to do is once you then have that ethane, ethane is the building block for almost everything that you see in this room. Everything from diapers to tires to paint to housewares to carpets all come from ethane. And what a cracker plant allows you to do is to separate that ethane into the PVCs and the other products that you see there. When I talked a little bit about horizontal drilling, the concept that we use from a horizontal drilling is basically two holes go in the ground and then out like a spider, four to five wells on each side. What that allows you to do is minimize the impact on the earth. Instead of taking potentially a 24 or 25 acre parcel and having a whole bunch of holes in the ground you're putting in two, you're going down eight to 10,000 feet and you're going out as far as five to 8,000 feet underneath the ground and you're pulling gas from there. When you're done, you're left with approximately one acre of land. Most private water wells are in depths of about 100 feet. Municipal wells are in depths of 1,000. As I said, we're drilling down 8 to 10,000 feet. And as we go through those crucial layers, we um, put different types of protection in using steel and cement, upwards of three, four, five layers to protect through those water sources. You can see uh, a lot of people, when they think about a, a horizontal drilling, that it comes straight down and then goes over at a 90 degree angle. That's just not possible. So it actually twists and turns its way underneath the ground in order to come out. Um, and then you'll see right at the bottom there, that's the piece that's actually fracked right there. It fracks the, um, the uh, earth itself. That gas is then pulled out up above the surface. A lot of folks think this is a big misconception, that this is a, a top secret chemicals that nobody talks about what's in their frack fluid. Well, first of all, it's 99.5% water. That water is used to push the material down, and then the sand component is actually used to keep those fractures open. Because if you were to make a crack in the earth at 10,000 feet below, the pressure of the earth would close that hole back up. And so the sand is left there in order to keep that open in order to extract the gas. The other chemicals that are listed, a lot of them are household type chemicals, a lot of them are lubricants, a lot of them prevent rust and corrosion. You have a, pipe, a metal pipe 10,000 feet down, 100 degree temperature mixing with water. But you can go to a website called Frack Focus, and our industry partners like Chesapeake list all of the chemicals that they use. It's not a Coca-Cola formula, it's not top secret, it's not something the industry won't share. It's all right there for you to read. What's interesting to note, um, when the industry uh, started getting its hand around some of the wells that they were um, working in, they started to do some private water testing. Pennsylvania now requires 2,500 feet for the nearest water source. What we found in doing all pre-tests is that over 40% of a million water wells are contaminated. This is prior to any drilling coming anywhere near them. There are no standards in Pennsylvania for wells. Some are cased with wood. Some are cased with concrete. Some are cased with nothing. And so what we found is that the majority of them have failed typical standards. 20 of them have contained pre-existing methane when drilling was hundreds of miles away. And so while it's important for the state and, and agencies to have um, standards from the private water well, it's very important to be able to get that baseline data of the pre-drill testing, which we now do. And many of our members test even further. The industry is big, as I said, on trying to reduce um, uh, the environmental impact. And so you can see, as I mentioned, from a 24-acre acre pad of vertical to a 5-acre pad of horizontal to that 1-acre pad. That is what a completed well looks like. It's not much more bigger than a, not much bigger than an SUV. It has a couple of uh, containers on it to, to uh, separate the water from the gas and then put it into a pipeline. The 
The industry has placed a tremendous emphasis on roads. I know Chesapeake out of Rome has spent hundreds of millions of dollars. Roads that were broke before the industry came, roads that the industry upgraded. When last year places like Badford County uh, had major flooding, the industry came in and repaired their roads. We don't like to drive on potholes just like you don't like to drive on potholes. Once the gas is pulled up out of the ground, the next piece that's needed is the gathering and transmission lines. These are the pipelines that are going into the ground. The gas isn't any good if you can't get it anywhere. And while the lower gas prices have slowed the industry down from a drilling standpoint, it has allowed the midstream companies to uh, continue to build the pipeline, the Constitution Pipeline, which is looking to come up into the New York area. Uh, leather stocking, which recently announced uh, their work on the pipelines. The Millennium Pipeline, the Transco Pipeline, all allowing this gas to be brought to the major markets of the Northeast. This is a pipeline in progress. Um, this was a spring, summer, and fall. This is a farmer's crop where they dug the trenches for the pipeline. The corn was planted and was harvested by the fall, all within the same season. So you can see how fast the industry moves that you wouldn't even know, uh, with the exception of that yellow stake in the bottom right hand corner that there was even a pipeline there. Compressor stations are another piece that has a lot of attention out there right now. It talks about air quality emissions, it talks about noise. Uh, we took uh, 15 college and university folks from northeastern Pennsylvania yesterday to an actual compressor station. Uh, standing outside the, the uh, station, there was very minimal noise. There were no odors. We stood by the exhaust areas. Uh, these are required in order to push the gas uh, to your homes, to your businesses. In Pennsylvania, uh, for example, we've had the Transco pipeline running by my house for 60 years. Until I started this job, I didn't even know it was there. But it's been there for 60 years, and then I found out two months ago that there was a compressor station four miles away. These are, these are necessary, they're important, and they're extremely safe. A little information about the Marcellus Shale Coalition. Uh, while we're mainly based in Pennsylvania, we have members that operate in New York, like a Talisman or Chesapeake, as well as Virginia, West, um, West Virginia, Ohio. We operate uh, both the Marcellus and the Utica Shale. We uh, work on long-term development. We try to act at our National Trade Association, just like the Chamber of Commerce, uh, for our members. We do fire safety training. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to find partner with the Department of Transportation, uh, the Pennsylvania State Police, do flagger training. Talking a little bit about the industry, in Pennsylvania, nationally, you can see some of the organizations that regulate what we do is one of the most heavily regulated industries in the country. Everything from fracturing to the drilling to site construction to midstream, the numerous regulations that follow our industry, the constant reporting that's required. Let's talk about some of the benefits from a, from a shale standpoint. You hear this comparison a lot of times between gas and coal. And we certainly know that gas is the cleanest burning fossil fuel, but people then will point to things like wind and solar. And you can see the amount of land required to produce the same amount of electricity for a thousand households when you compare to something like land, uh, wind or solar. While the industry does use a lot of water, again, when you look at the comparison to generate the same amounts of electricity, the water is much less. It's equivalent of what New York City drinks in four minutes or what a golf course uses in 25 days. What I'm happy to report is that many of our members recycle their water. Chesapeake, for example, recycles 100% of their water. So the water that they put in, they pull back out of the ground to use at the next operation. Technology is changing every day and it's allowing our members to not only recycle their water, but other members are starting to move towards actually using natural gas to power their equipment on an actual drilling operation. So monitoring done by a health effects study show um, that there were no uh, increases. In fact, a recent study came out by the EPA showing a reduction in carbon dioxide emissions. More and more coal-fired plants are being converted over to gas. For one of the first times in history, gas has surpassed coal as the largest generator of electricity here in the United States. And two weeks ago, a new power plant in Bradford County was permitted. It's going to rely solely on gas. 
Another thing that the coalition does is that we set up a series of recommended practices that our members have agreed to live by. And these are standards that go above and beyond the typical requirements set by a DEP or an EPA. An example, in, in terms of doing site reuse, we talk about uh, the quality and condition of roads. We talk about when a field is being replanted or a site is being uh, reclaimed, putting on, you know, maybe planting clover for, for animals. Uh, the Fish and Game Commission uh, recently came out talking about the increase of the pheasant population uh, in northeastern Pennsylvania and other parts of Pennsylvania, specifically attributed to the gas industry. <coughs> These are some of the taxes, some of the impact fees, some of the revenue generated. Over $100 million last year was paid to some residents in Bradford County through royalties and through lease payments. These are the savings. People talk about gas and they don't realize that in many cases gas is used to generate electricity. So while your home heating bill is going down, your gas prices are going down. That savings to you might be $20 a month, it might be $10 a month. But to that manufacturer, that savings is $2,000 a month. Here's just some headlines uh, recently in uh, papers in Pennsylvania. Some key reports talking about the amount of gas that's in Pennsylvania alone becoming an ex exporter, how much money uh, is potentially generated. This has become uh, one of the number one talking points. In my former position, um, I led a lot of our economic development workforce uh, in initiatives. Uh, I helped uh, coordinate the uh, Marcella Shales Workforce Committee. One of the things we do is we poll our members every year to find out who they're hiring, where they're hiring them from, what they're paying, and what needs they have, not just now, but in the next 30 years. We take that information and we go back out to colleges, universities, trades associations, Labor and industry uh, came out with a report two weeks ago that in Pennsylvania alone, we're going to have an increase in the need of 75% more engineers than we currently have. 75% engineers, these are salaries that generate between 80 and $100,000. There's over 200,000 people that work in our industry from direct and indirect jobs. And from a direct core standpoint, that average salary is $80,000. It's $30,000 higher than the Pennsylvania average. And even in the ancillary industry, it's about $64,000. And contrary to proper belief, not everybody's from Texas or Oklahoma. Um, for the last two years running, over 70% of the new hires have all been from Pennsylvania. We hope that number goes up to 100. And we're working with our colleges and universities to make that happen. And that last check, there's approximately 2,300 jobs still available on our job portal. Still, uh, even though the gas drilling is at a low because of the prices of gas, the industry still needs over 2,000 people. Another fact that people don't realize is that it takes over $5 million to do a well. Sometimes that number can go as high as $8 million to do a well from start to finish. And getting into the supply chain and setting up for the other speakers, there are over 400 individuals, 150 different companies needed to do a well. Everyone will see the name Chesapeake, or they'll see the name Cabot, and they think that that is everything controlled there. And I don't want to steal my thunder, but when you look at that, they have a small piece of it. They have a big piece. They own the, they own the minerals. They own the, the, the roads, the, the uh, rights. But there's a lot of subcontractors, and it's important for our businesses to know where you fall in and who you need to talk to in order to get into that industry. You need to know where your business might fit. Is it the pre-drilling stage? Is it the drilling stage? Are you an engineering company? Are you a law firm? Are you a logistics company? I'm going to skip through this because I'd like to talk about it in a little more detail. But you can see from a supply chain standpoint, our direct effect, you know, the, the e &P companies, the drilling companies, and as that spreads out, the people providing the pipes to providing uh, legal services, iron and steel, out to the workforce and development, the entertainment piece, the mom and pops. From an industry standpoint, we're active in our communities. In addition to the impact fee, we give tons of money to the United Way. Uh, we play an active role in helping the communities that we serve. I talked about uh, this uh, concept of recommended practices. One of our recommended practices specifically states that our members are to do business with local businesses. So, again, it's not the idea that you move into Pennsylvania or New York to operate 
and you start working with companies in Texas, Oklahoma, or California, it just makes good business sense to do business with the people that are next to you, to around you, to get those goods as quick as possible. From an industry standpoint, it's important to understand our culture. We are very contractual by nature. Compliance is huge. The industry places a tremendous amount of emphasis, as it should, on safety and responsible drilling, on environmental impacts. If you have a violation uh, in hauling sand, if you, uh, if you do something that you shouldn't, if you fail a, a drug test, there's somebody there ready to take your place. And so that's very important to understand in going in with this industry. It's important to know, as I said, where you fall in the upstream, midstream, or downstream needs. Whether that your product, whether your service should focus on the dry gas or the wet gas. It's important to know how prices affect our industry. All too often you'll see a, a business, uh, you know, might be a small mom and pop in a booming area, run out and buy a whole bunch of water trucks because the price of gas is going up. But what happens when that price of gas comes down? Uh, last week or two weeks ago, it was around uh, $3.00. It was at highs of upwards of $8, $10, and it was at low of $2. Well, the gas industry is not going to drill uh, a lot of rigs out there at $2. Again, it takes $5 million plus dollars to do a well. That gas number um, that becomes important for the industry is gas to be around $4 or $5 a gallon. It's important to know where, again, your company fits from a stage standpoint and what product or component that you offer. Besides low gas prices, besides low electricity, one of the other things that this gas is doing is allowing manufacturers to come back to Pennsylvania. The three refineries in Philadelphia that were recently shuttered have opened up in the Marcuswick area specifically because of gas. Park West Range Resources are now sending a lot of that gas over there to help run those refineries. We talked about the cracker facility, the plastics industry, textile firms, have the ability to use that gas at a lower price. We're seeing companies like Bayer, the Dow Chemical, and Shell moving back to the United States, moving into Pennsylvania to rely on this. You see, as I talked about before, some of the outlying impacts from hotels going up, from businesses double, tripling their employment, tripling their revenues. This is just a small sampling out in Washington County of some of the businesses out there experiencing the increase. It's important to know, as I mentioned before, the contracting and subcontracting nature. While Chesapeake might be the owner, they'll have a prime contractor. Sometimes companies like a Halliburton will then bolt. Then you'll have a drilling services company. You'll have a company responsible to prepare the pad. You'll have a company responsible to um, reclaim the pad. It's important to realize from a safety standpoint how we operate to make sure that your business has the credentials necessary. This goes on a little bit more about uh, safety and quality, knowing that we're geographically dispersed, continuous operations, 24-7, non-stop, the weather doesn't play a factor. And again, depending upon what role you play, you need to know that whether you're working in the industry, in some roles it's, you know, 14 hour, 12 hour days, 14 on, 14 off, that well is constantly working. And so it's important that your business or your service is able to be responsive to that. One of the other things that Act 13 did, and I talked about the, the impact fee, but another piece is that Act 13 has a parameter that the producer shall provide the maximum opportunity to small businesses, to veteran, to minority, to women owned. And our industry plays a very big emphasis on them. One of the ways that you can take advantage of that is what's called Marcellus on Main Street. You don't have to have drilling here tomorrow to be able to be on Marcellus on Main Street. It's $25. It's very inexpensive. That's not the plug. The plug is that uh, certainly we'll work with the, uh, the folks here in Binghamton, the Greater Binghamton, to make sure everyone that's here today can go on that site for free so you can be listed on there. What that allows you to do, whether you're a college and university, whether you're, a, whether you're a hotel, or whether you're one of the supply chain companies, is to be able to list your business on there to talk about what you do. To be able to say, here I am, I'm a woman uh, certified, I'm a minority certified, I am just a small business, I'm a big business, and here's the products that I serve. The other component that this does is this is how you can stay in touch with our industry. 
We offer what's called supply chain events, where we'll go to a community and we'll bring our members, and our members will say, just like a trade show, here's what I need. This was the recent supply chain that we had, and this company needed everything from office equipment to transmission systems to valves for drilling. And you'll see these come up all the time. Our companies will go out there. We'll have webinars. We recently had a webinar with Shell, how to do business with Shell, where we had their top contractors, subcontractors, go out on the webinar, and everyone that was on Marcellus on Main Street and participated and was able to sign up. There was no cost to do that to find out what Shell needed, what your business might be able to provide in terms of a product or service. This is just a, a showing of what your listing would look like. You can search it via the map. If someone's searching for an engineering company, they would be able to find you that way. You could be as descriptive as you want on the site. In closing, I would just like, like to talk a little bit about the future of one of the ways we see uh, gas going. Besides, again, that, that low cost, uh, we look at CMG as really uh, one of the next potentials. Uh, within the last two weeks, the price of gas per gallon in California was over $5. I don't know when it became acceptable for $4, but it's certainly not acceptable for $5. The last week in some parts of Oklahoma, the price to fill your car with natural gas was $1.88 a gallon. $1.88 a gallon versus $5 a gallon to me is a pretty big difference. This is one of the opportunities that we have in terms of using something like CNG, compressed natural gas. This is where it becomes, it's not the company that has the land getting, or the landowner getting the royalty piece. That's just a small portion. It's you being able to heat your home for less. It's you being able to drive your car for less. We recently did a study that talked about the potential of savings, not only in costs, but the amount of emissions that would be reduced by converting cars to natural gas. And we're seeing that with fleets. We're seeing companies like Waste Management, FedEx, UPS converting their cars. The biggest success that we have is a company called Procter & Gamble. I'm sure most of you heard Procter & Gamble. Here's what Procter & Gamble did. They drilled some wells. They produced gas. They produced so much gas, they used part of that gas to run some of their machinery, to heat their facility. They take that excess gas and they sell it off to the grid, generating a profit. They had so much gas, they converted 25 of their trucks that haul their product to compress natural gas. They don't pay to fill their trucks up. Their trucks that require hundreds of gallons of fuel a week, they're saving hundreds of thousands of dollars a month by filling up their trucks on their own gas. They have a lot of gas. They're taking that gas and they're creating electric generators on their property. They're generating their own electricity from the gas that they have. They are energy neutral. They are selling the additional gas capacity, and they're going one step further. They're increasing their plant. They're hiring more people. And they're now attracting their contractors, their suppliers, next to them to use the gas, to use the electricity to be generated by the gas. That's an American success story. That's what New York has the ability to duplicate, to replicate.